welcome everyone. The purpose of today's seminar is to give you an understanding to the residential building contract and the sections that underlie and, and are behind this contract. Joining us today are two of my colleagues, John Duncalf and Paul Kearney. Both are builders, both are long time industry participants, both have a great underpinning knowledge to what's, how the contract should be used and what's in behind it and how the contract can be used as a successful tool in your building business. It is my hope that you will leave here with a greater understanding and a greater confidence that this is an easy tool to use, it is a powerful tool to use and it will add value to your business throughout your working career as a principal contractor. To lead off today's discussion, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Paul Turner. Thanks, Damien. Welcome, everybody. Um, okay, guys, we're here to talk about contracts today. Just to get a feel for me, I'd just like to see a show of hands of for those of you who currently have a BSA contractor's license, be it a um, carpenter license or a bricklayer license or even a restricted builder's license. Yep. Okay. Now, tell me those of you that currently have a contract in place either with your builder or an owner if you work for an owner. Come on, be honest. Okay. Not, not the greatest but not too bad. All right. The fact that so many of you put up your hands to say that you have a contractor's license is good, but guys, you've already been here. You've already done this. You've been through a business management course. You know that you've got to have contracts by law, and you're going to hear me say that a lot today, that all oh, this is the law. Why don't you have contracts in place, particularly with, the, with your builders? Now, I've got a fair idea why, if you're working for, if you're, if you're working for a builder and you're working on wages and you're an employee and the definition of that is, is fairly clear, he's going to pay you wages, holiday pay, annual leave loading, all that sort of stuff. If you get that, then you are an employee. <coughs> if you don't get that and you're working for a builder as a contractor and all he does is pay you, you are a subcontractor. And the law says, and you know it because you've done the business management course, that you have got to have a contract in place. Okay, why do I think you don't? Well, it's fairly simple. You just don't want to rock the boat. And I've been there. I'm a builder. Damien's a builder. John's a builder. We've all been. We know what, uh, what you guys are going through. The reason why we're here today is because you guys are going to turn into the, one of those builders one day. Do you really believe that it's fair that you have that feeling with the builder that you currently deal with? I'm hoping that after today that you will turn that around, that when you're a builder and you have people working for you, that you do the right thing and you actually provide them with a contract because it is the builder's responsibility. It's not your responsibility to go and do it, even though you know it's got to be done. It's the builder's responsibility to provide you with that contract. So when you do finish this and you do get your builder's license, I'm hoping that I don't sit, I don't have people sitting in a classroom like this saying, oh, I'm too scared to go to the builder. They should already have one, already have a contract in place. What we're going to talk about today is contracts. I'm going to deal mainly with a residential building contract, brick veneer, plasterboard, tile roof, three bedroom, two bathroom, double lockup garage, simple, plain house. Those of you who do fairly large renovations will probably be able to relate to it as well. Well, this is what the law is. The law is the Queensland Building Services Authority Act and the Domestic Building Contracts Act. That's what you've got to abide by. It says there a head contract between builders and owners or a subcontract between a builder and a subcontractor. That's what you've got to do. When you get your builder's license, if you're going out there and building, with an, and building for an owner, you've got to have a contract in place. 
if you've got subcontractors working for you, you've got to have a subcontract in place. All comes under that act. Okay, next one. <coughs> All right, where do you get these contracts from? If you've got a very expensive solicitor, then you might get someone to write one up. Probably not advisable because of the industry that we're in. It's not that delicate to have a solicitor or, a, or someone write up a contract. You're probably better off just going to one of these, either the HIA, Master Builders or the BSA. They've all got them. They're all compliant to the Domestic Building Contracts Act. You can purchase them. You can get them online. Your clients will be aware of them and they're easy to sign. Some of you guys should be using one of these right now. Simple Works Contract is a simple one-page document, but in that one-page document, there are a lot of terms and conditions that will assist you and your owner get through the building process. Simple Works Contract is to the value of up to $3,300. This contract may also be used by trade contractors for work involving maintenance, other trade work direct with an owner. If you're not doing it using a contract now, you guys really should be looking at using one of these right now before you get into the building industry. Uh, before, sorry, before you get, get up to as a builder. Okay. The next one, the next one is a minor works contract. As you can see there, worth up to the value of $30,000. A little bit bigger in contracts, got a few more terms and conditions in it that deal with you know, probably minor renovations would be a good one to, to use this for. Once you get over the minor renovations, you're talking major renos or a complete building, then you've got to start dealing with residential building contracts. Okay. The residential building contract, it is for house builders, which you guys are going to become between you, the builder, and the owner for the construction of a single detached dwelling or a duplex, and for builders and owners for the renovation, alteration, extension, improvement, or repair of a home, and for work consisting of removal or reciting a detached dwelling. So if you're gonna go out there, if your intention is to become a builder to do any of that sort of work, you've got to have a contract in place. And it would normally be a residential building contract for all that type of work. Now this is where the complicated bit comes into it. I don't expect you guys to get into the complicated bit. The contract itself is very simple. Very, it's written in plain English, so you can understand it, so your owner can understand it. However, attached to that are terms and conditions of the contract. I would expect that each and every one of you would read that, the, those terms and conditions because your customer will. They will know, they will have read every one of these and if you, when you deal with them, haven't got knowledge of it, what are they gonna think of you? So in the back of a contract, we have terms and conditions. Now I'm not gonna go through all these, but you can see the terms and conditions, cooling off period. They've got an option to get out of the, con out of the contract up front. I'll go through all these a little bit later. What do we do with money? Loan approval and finance extremely important. Workplace health and safety, the site, the care of the work, time for practical completion, extensions of time. I'm gonna go through all these as we go through the day. But you can see that there are 30 different terms and conditions on a contract. That's in accordance with the Domestic Building Contracts Act. Depending on where you get your contract from, whether it be HIA or Master Builders or BSA, there might be a little bit more in there but it all is legal, it all relates to the Domestic Building Contracts Act. To start with, with this contract, you're gonna have to go out there and do a, a fair bit of work before you actually enter into a contract. There is a way to cover that, and that is through a preliminary agreement. What I'm gonna do is get John to come and have a talk to you about a preliminary agreement, and, and he'll be able to explain why this document is so important to the contracts that I'll go through with you a little bit later. Okay, thanks, John. <laughs> okay, okay. What we want to do is explain to you about the preliminary agreement is that preliminary agreements are the forward part of any contract where you actually obtain information. As you can see there, 
relates to soil tests or foundation data, preparing plans, engineering, could even be in relation to looking at getting a building approval. You actually get paid to do these tasks. I can't give you a quantum amount on what that amount might be. You might say to the owner, I will perform you these tasks and we have, Master Builders actually has a, a set out sheet so you can do this quite easily. It's just a matter of ticking which ones you want. And you can say, give me $5,000. It has got nothing to do with the contract amount. In fact, how many of you, and from our own experience in the past, Damien, Paul and myself, how many of you spend hours quoting a job and then may miss the job? Now we've got 95% of people saying they do. The task, sorry, under the preliminary agreement actually enables you to get some form of payment. As I said to you earlier, if you use a preliminary agreement, the owner owns that information, not your quote. One of the things I do stress is that please do a specification. Make sure the owner knows what you are going to give them. So for example, I'm going to give them granite bench tops on their kitchen. Old mate here is actually going to give them just laminex. So how can we be comparing apples with apples? We aren't. So please make sure you do a specification or encourage the owners to sit down and do a specification. Things such as what type of internal doors, what type of locks they want, what type of taps do they want, what type of basins do they want, what type of hot water system do they want. All those things that to us are simple are not so much simple to the owner. You need to guide them with it. So a preliminary agreement is just a standalone document. It is outside of the contract. So get a spec done, you need the plans done, soil test done, site survey, and it's not formed part of the contract, the contract part comes later. All right, Paul. Thanks, John. <laughs> when we issue a contract to an owner, for many, many years, the building industry has <coughs> developed this situation where, here, owner, here's your contract. Most people just sign a contract. They don't look at the terms, they don't look at its conditions. Um, I guarantee you that not too many of you would have written, would have read the conditions of your insurance claim. Not to defy too much, but that's why most of these people that are um, suffering problems with their insurance with the flood, um, simply because they didn't read too much detail into the into their insurance policy. <laughs> but it's a whole different story. It's floods and floods and all that sort of stuff. Anyway. What's happened was that the tribunal were getting um, inundated with problems between builders and owners. That there would be a, a problem on site and the builder would say, well, I'm not going to do anything about that. And it would end up in a dispute, end up in the, in the tribunal. And what the tribunal was finding is that the, the owners didn't really understand the contract information. So they brought out a law now, I'm a builder, so I'm on your side, but the government brought out a law to say, okay, big nasty building industry, you're going to have to give advice to the owner before you enter into a contract about what it's all about. So someone decided that they would come up with this contract information statement. And basically what it does, it tells the owner what this contract's all about in simple terms. It's the law. You're going to hear me say that a lot today, but it is the law. You've got to give one of these, whether it be a master builder's one if you're using a master builder's contract, BSA one if you're using a BSA contract, you've got to give one of these to the owner. I would suggest when you go out there and start building and start to developing your contracts that you actually read this because that's what the owner is going to come back to you with. It says in the contract information statement that you're going to do blah, 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 blah. Well, you've got to be aware of what's in there so you can either dispute it or not. If it gets into a really, really, really in-depth dispute and you have to go to all those conditions of the contract, usually solicitors are involved by that stage so, or, or people like John that know those things. But most owners rely on this information and if you've looked at the BSA website, BSA are out there for consumer protection and they provide a hell of a lot more information on their website than what's involved in one of these. So consumer awareness is, 
is becoming more and more intense. John being a, a disputes manager, um, back in our, our, our days, John, um, uh, consumer awareness is, is just ri rising so much. They know these things better than what you guys do, which is so wrong. It really is. Anyway, one of these. You've got to give one of these to the owner. And it's got to be done within five working days of entering into a contract. So you can't just give them a contract in this. You've got to give them one of these as well. Who did you give that? I'll leave that up there. Okay. After you've done that, you've given them that contract information statement, you've given them the contract, they then have a period of time that they can get out of the contract. It's called a cooling off period. At the moment, a client can withdraw, but it must be within five working days of receiving from the builder a signed contract and a contract information statement. If they do pull out of that, out of the contract, you're entitled to get paid for the work you've done. Go back to John's preliminary agreement. You've got an agreement. If they pull out, you're entitled, because you've got that agreement in place, you're entitled to get paid. If you haven't done any of that, but you've provided them with a, a contract and you don't have a preliminary agreement or anything like that, you still have the opportunity of giving them back their deposit, <coughs> but you're only going to get $100 for your trouble. For an administrative, someone thought $100 is a good fee to pay a builder for all the work that he does. So, if you, just, if you want more than 100 bucks for all the trouble that you've gone to, I would suggest what John's just told you, to enter into preliminary agreement so then you can get all the money that you've paid for a soil test, a survey, plans, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Cooling off period. I'll give you an example. Young couples out there looking for a home. They've gone through all their, their financial stuff, or they think they have. Um, they recognise that the government are now giving a, a, a really good uh, subsidy for first home buyers. So they're out on the weekend looking at uh, display homes and they go through one of these display home places where you've got to walk through the, through the garage and you can't get out unless you walk back out through the garage and you go and have a look at uh, three homes. You know what I'm talking about. As they're walking out, salesman gets hold of them. Oh, are you interested? And, and, and really, really starts to... And by the time the salesman has finished, they're convinced that they can afford to buy one of these homes or get one built because that's what salesmen do. They're really good at it. So they look at each other. Yeah, okay, we can do this. We, yeah, we'll get this grant. And salesman's, yeah, we'll get your finance and all that sort of stuff. They sign an agreement. Salesman signed them up on the weekend. They go home all excited to, to mum and dad. Hey, we've just, we, we're going to get a house built. Oh. Mum and dad say, well, no, oh, that's great, but can we have a look at, show us what, you, what you're going to do. And they go through it all and suddenly realise that financially <coughs> they're going to be desperate if they go down this track. So what the cooling off period has done has stopped me as the nasty builder signing people up to build a house and then not letting them get out of it. Builders back in my day, that's what they do. They so they'd have gutless, uh, they'd have cutthroat salesmen out there that had signed someone up and then when they come back and say, oh look, I, we've done our figures and we really don't think that we can afford it, we want out, <laughs> I'd be sitting there saying, oh, no way. I'm not that bad, but I know that, uh, that builders out there used to do that. So, again, the government brought in a legislation to say that you must give the owner an opting out period. Now that cooling off period is five days to stop us big nasty people from making little people get into a contract. When you enter into a, into a contract, Again, the law says that you're allowed to take a deposit. However, the law also says that if the contract is worth $20,000 or more, you're only allowed to take 
5% of the total contract value. If the contract is less worth less than $20,000, you can take 10%. All right, so basically what I'm saying here is if you enter into a, a proper fully blown residential building contract that's worth $400,000 or half a million dollars, you can only take 5% deposit. If you enter into a minor works contract, a smaller one, you can take 10% because it's a smaller job, you'll probably spend more money up front. If you go into, if you enter into a simple works contract, you probably find that you don't take a deposit, you get payment on completion. All right, so five percent. Don't even think about taking any more. And again, it's only through our experience where a builder, or I, a story that I'm familiar with that the builder lost, was that the builder said, "You pay me." for the material, it was only a small job, but you pay me for the material before it gets delivered. And that's what he was saying was his deposit. So I think if I remember rightly, it was uh, somewhere around $100,000. And he asked for a $60,000 deposit. So he could pay the material, he was, he was strapped, he didn't have any cash. So he paid for the material got the owner to pay for the material that was deemed as the deposit obviously a hell of a lot more than 10 percent builder ordered the material it went on the site there ended up being a dispute fair enough the builder had a contract in place did the right thing had a contract information statement did the right thing had did the cooling off period did all of the right stuff except he took too much of a deposit because he was strapped the judge said sorry you're wrong he lost. No, it wasn't me, but he lost because he broke the laws of the Domestic Building Contract Act. So that one, that one really is important that when you fill out your contract, it will tell you. All the contracts will tell you. The Master Builders one, the HIA one and the, and the BSA one will say no more than 5% or no more than 10%. So it'll give you, it will give you a prompt. So most of this stuff that, that I'm talking about here with the contracts, they've been written in, well, to me, they've been written in simple English that you will understand them, that a, an owner will understand them instead of having a, a, a contract that looks like an insurance policy that's got pages and pages of stuff that you will never, ever, ever read. So when, you fill in, when you're filling out a contract, it is very simple to fill out a contract. The conditions on the back of the contract, all those 33 conditions, that's the stuff that John and I have to <laughs> concern about if you guys get yourself into a, into a situation that you want help, well then we will go to the clauses and conditions to help you get through those situations. So whilst it's a good idea to make sure you read it, the, con the contract itself is very easy. Name, address, how much you're going to charge, how much you're going to have as deposit, all that sort of stuff. Very easy to, to follow on all three contracts. So I'd like John to just go through this one with you. It's the different methods of how you're going to get paid as you go through the contract. Okay, progress payments. As Paul said earlier, the situation you have with progress payments is that they are already prescribed to you under the Domestic Building Contracts Act. It is not something that anyone made up, it's not something that the BSA made up, the HIA made up or the Master Builders made up. These payments here, which remember what Paul said earlier, was in relation to the deposit which is fixed at 5%. You can't take more than that 5%. When you get the base stage down, you've got a 10% payment. Now, what I actually say to people is, if you have a standard, low set, high set house, you are going to be stuck with what they call as method A payments. You all would have remembered having a look through your contract, you've got method A and you've got method B. So method A has these stages. Now the important part here is this, is that each stage has a definition. If you read, or the 85% of you that haven't actually read the conditions of the contract yet, will see that there are definitions. The base stage, the frame stage, the enclosed stage, the fixing stage, and by the way, practical completion is not a progress payment, but I'll get to that in a minute. They have a set definition 
of when you can claim. Not when you're nearly there, you have to have completed the stage. The reason we're telling you all this information is simple. While Paul said earlier that we're not trying to actually go on about disputes today, we are trying to keep you out of trouble because we don't want to see you be in breach of the contract. We don't want to see you be the person who's actually behind the eight ball. We want to see you the person who's in front of the eight ball. Now, those stages are fixed and those of you who are already in your assessment have already done your cash flow projection, you will know that you're already in the negative. That was actually set out by the state government to have a little bit of hurt factor in there for you. All right? They just want you to have that little bit of pain so you keep going. And the, the profit part comes at the end. Now, the practical completion, this payment here, the practical completion is not a progress claim. It is the practical completion claim. It stands alone at the very end. If you read your conditions of contract, you'll see there are clear uh, guidelines on obligations on the both parties at practical completion. So please, I beg of you, please read those conditions. In relation to the other part here, we're using this as an example of method B. The simple way that I say to people where you can use method B is where the style or the, or the method of construction is something that's out of the ordinary. It is not normal. A pole home, for example. A house on a sloping site that might be three different levels or four levels. That is not what the intent of the legislation was for. However, having said that, if you now create your own payment um, definition, you need to define that. Because sometimes people come to me and they say, okay, we've got a lockup. Can anyone see lockup as a standard definition of what I've just said? So what I mean as lockup, what this gentleman means as lockup, what you mean as lockup, can be completely different. So you've got to be very careful here, starting to create your own words of wisdom. And let me just say, I've seen some really great words of wisdom because it even has me confused. So these parts here, the base, the frame, the enclosed and the fixing are actually already defined in the contract. When you start to use method B, and you can use method B, there's not a problem. But bear in mind, you need to make sure that the definition or the stage in which you're going to claim that payment is clearly defined. Example, I mentioned earlier that we're going to do a pole home. So we're going to do a pole home. There's usually a lot of earthworks and civil works involved in doing a, a pole home. Has anyone here done one as well? All right, you'd know. Because you've got to try and get in there, get your excavator in so you can get the holes done, etc., etc. You may in actual fact, for example, do a claim when the poles are in place. So how you would word that, I don't have the answers right now. You may then say, well, okay, I'm going to get my first floor down. Now, does the first floor mean you're going to actually have the floor down, structural floor down, or just the floor joists? You need to be that detailed. <coughs> so be very careful. I have no problems, guys. If you get a situation and you need advice, if you can't get onto Damien or you can't get onto Paul, ring us. That is as simple as advice that we can give you today. If you're in trouble and you're not sure how to do it, sit down with someone who's been there and we can go through that with you. Can I just give you a scenario, John, that I'd like you to yeah. answer, if you could, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm a builder, yes. right? And I'm going to build a, just an everyday, ordinary, three bedroom, two bathroom, double lock-up garage, low set, brick veneer on a block. But part of my contract, the owner wants me to put in a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. The only way that I can get the swimming pool in is to actually put the shell in before I pull the slab. Yep. Now, under uh, this, I'm only building a normal house, so I'm really obliged to do frame and close. Mm. But am I entitled to get paid for the for, for the amount of money that I've put to done to put the pool in? Because it cost me a lot of money. If that's that's if that's the hardest one you're going to give me today, guys. The easiest answer to that question is this. If you have something that requires to be done previously to the main works, you can actually look at the doing a payment in your special conditions. Not using method B, but look at you making a special condition within the contract. And in actual fact, if you have a situation where you do have a pool in relation to a house, my advice is to actually split the animals. Why would I suggest that? 
The reason would be is that you're going to actually, if you've got to do work for the pool and there's something that goes pear-shaped with it, it doesn't affect the duration of the contract for the house. You can have a special condition in the pool contract, but the housing contract does not commence until the pool shell is in. Hmm. So in actual fact, you can split it or you have the other option of making it part of the special conditions in the head contract. Is that clear? Okay, so you, you've now got two contracts. Mm. All right. Same scenario, I'm the builder, yep. right? Building the same house, but let's not make it a pool. I've got to cut out half the mountain yep. and put up a huge retaining wall. And yep. this retaining wall is going to cost me a couple of, th couple of hundred thousand dollars to build. Yep. Am I still obligated now to still stick with frame enclosed and... Is that the best you're going to do today? <laughs> um, okay, in that regards there, what I would do is this. If you have a look at the schedule of your works, if you're going to actually have a massive excavation, and what I say about massive is, I reckon that if you've got anything that's actually greater than three metres, now, why would I actually pick the figure of three metres? Your soil conditions at three metres will change. In most factors, any soil conditions actually relate to the top two metres of soil. So once you go over three metres, then you, I would actually be suggesting that you cut the block as a contract, do your retaining walls, get the site prepared. Then do your soil tests, then do the house. Got another, you got a hard one? Lift and slide a reno. Oh, okay. That one I got good. him. That is good. I got him. Renovation work, especially when you're doing um, old houses uh, in older areas, say wherever you might be, there becomes a lot of issues here in relation to actually in builder's insurance. Yes. All right? Yes. Now, believe it or not, you can't, as the builder, get insurance when you actually start to look at re um, removing a house. The house removalists can because they've got their own special insurance for that, but the builder can't. So again, when you're starting to look at those type of things, the advice that we give is get your house removalist to site the building on his, pigs, on his styes. You've seen the blocks and everything they do. Everyone's seen those? Get him to site it. Even if part of his work is to actually put in the stumps, the steel posts, whatever you want, then you come in and do your part of the work. Yeah, so but when do I get owner, paid? Sorry? When do I get paid? You get paid for the work you do. The owner is actually going to engage the, the house removalist to do the slip and slide mm -hmm. and the siting. All right, so that's a contract between the owner and the house removalist. Mm -hmm. The builder, old mate here, is now going to come in, get the saber downstairs done, get the walls up, get the weatherboards on, whatever. So it's actually the owner is doing two contracts. Mm -hmm. Guys, it was a dark jumper. The question was, does that mean you, that you don't actually get a markup or make any money on that particular part? The answer is yes. But the other question, the other part of the answer is the fact is that you can't get the insurance. If it fell over, what are you gonna do? So for the measly five or $10,000 you would have made, now you've got a house sitting on its side and you're gonna to have to pay 80,000, what are you gonna do? So sometimes it's not always about the money. Guys, I need you to understand and remember, we're talking about a scope of work here. The moment you take on that complete scope of work and it's outside any insurance that you can get, yes, you can get construction work insurance and you can get public liability insurance. But for that particular work, it is not covered under those insurance schemes. The question was in relation to removing a house or reciting a house on a block of land. The first part is getting it into the correct position, right? That's the owner's responsibility. It's not your responsibility. See, the trouble is that you are all such big-hearted people is that you believe that you should be doing everything for the owner. Remember what I said earlier in relation to development DA applications or development applications, which a house removal is, by the way, so it requires a development application. That's not your problem. Your problem is going to be to give them a product when they finally give you something to work with. The question was, if you came to the job and there was actually something wrong on the site which you found, then yes, the answer is that you would need to now do a variation with the owner for that extra work because your scope of work has now changed. Remember what I said? It's a scope of work, when the and Paul will talk about variations later on today. Mm. All right? <coughs> so we'll just keep going here at the moment. This particular slide that we've got here is that under the legislation, it says that you must give to the owner a period of time to do the works. Now, it is not just the construction period, 
that might be 16 weeks, Monday to Friday. You must make allowances for all other delays. Weekends, public holidays, if you're going across the Christmas period, the Christmas shutdown. So all of a sudden, something that might normally be only going to take you probably, let's just say, 70 days, may go out to 235 days on your construction period. That's the construction period you've got. Now, you need to understand this quite clearly. As Paul said earlier, part of the conditions in the contract is also, I'll, we get to it later, is about liquidated damages. Yep. Now, the situation you've got is that you're saying to the owner, I'm going to build you a house within 235 days, as an example. If, for example, you're now at 250 days, what Mr and Mrs Smith have done is they've notified their landlord, they've notified the removalist that they want them on day 236. When you tell them now that you can't be in till day 250, what do you think they think of you? All right. If you say to someone, okay, I'm going to get you in at 135 days and you're still going at 250 days, then there's going to be real trouble. There's going to be real, real trouble. So what you need to do, and that's why part of the exercise in your assessment book is about setting out a time flow chart. Remember doing that part? Have, you, have anyone not done that part yet? You're required to do a time flow. The idea is to say, okay, if I get this job, when can I start? Not actually saying on that exact date, but I know that this house or this job, especially renovations, as, as everyone knows, renovations are probably the hardest thing to try and determine, is saying, okay, I reckon I can get it done in, say, 16 weeks. So the 16 weeks are the Mondays to the Fridays. I've got one, two, three, public four public holidays, 16 <coughs> sets of weekends, and in that as well, you might have your wedding anniversary and you're going to take your wife away for a week's holiday. So all the delays need to be included. It's what they call calculable delays. In the contracts, be it whatever type, there's also a part called incalculable delays. Now the incalculable delays, I actually simply say to people, put in your contract, allocate, oh, sorry, delays due to imported materials. Why would I say that? Well, everything's imported. Literally everything is just about imported, whether it be your toilet suites, a lot of timber, anything. So therefore, you've actually got a situation now where it actually says in the contract too is what is the cause or what is the effect that that delay is going to have on your contract? The simple answer is it will extend the practical completion date. That's the effect it's going to have. Paul will talk to you a bit more later on about variations and everything else. But time extension notices a very important piece of equipment in your arsenal of administration of your contract. If you get a situation, by the way, in this part here, we actually haven't even allowed for the wet weather. So you've actually got to allow for what you believe will be the amount of wet weather that is determined during that period as well. So we're not actually going to probably have the completion date there. We may actually have it down here somewhere by the time we have the rain. But if we go back, for example, to December, January of, of well, December of 2010 and January of, 2000, of 2011. What happened? It rained and it rained and it rained and then it flooded and it flooded and it flooded. All right? If you're out at people, out places like Emerald or out west, it actually flooded twice. So how is your program going to go then? No good. All right? So then you would need to actually know, give the owner a notice of time extension because that is something that is outside of your control. What is the length of the time? You're not going to know. Do it in two week blocks if you have to, do it as for a month, whatever. When I was actually building commercial work, my contract simply stated that if there was one day of rain, it constituted three days of extension of time because I couldn't get back on the site. We had situations where we would have footings, we would be pumping footings out for 24 hours a day just to try and get concrete in the ground. And of course what happens then? You're putting, your base gets wet, you've got to get it out because your engineer doesn't want you to have anything loose material in there, so you've got to keep going. And all of a sudden now, instead of having pad puddings for a portal frame, I've now actually got something that will hold up a skyscraper. All right. So that was the, the half the problem. John, just on that, mm. I've issued a time extension claim to an owner because of wet weather and 
they all know that it's wet, but I haven't been able to get on the site for a month because of the conditions. And the owner looks out, it's been fine, what's your problem? They don't realise that I can't actually put machinery on the, yep. on the site. They're not going to sign that time extension claim. What do I do? The good thing about a time extension claim is it is actually unlike a variation where the owner has to actually sign it, it is simply a document you give the owner, they don't actually have to sign it. They can um, dispute the claim, but that is a dispute I'd rather have later on. In actual fact, Paul is right. We've actually had a situation down the Gold Coast where an owner and a builder were actually at loggerheads, major loggerheads. The owner said, I don't care, I want you to get material there. They actually took the tiles out there on a truck and there it sat for five days up <laughs> to the axles. The builder then went back to the owner and said, thank you, now you're going to incur the cost of that truck not working and everything else. And the owner backed off. The owner finally could realise what the builder was trying to say. So a time extension notice is a notice that you give to the owner. You're not begging for their approval. It's a notice that you're giving. And after that, we can have the dispute later on. That part is easy. A question before you go, John. I've worked out with my house that it's going to take 60 days to build. Yep. I've worked out my Gantt chart and my progress and all that, and if I get all my trades and everything on time, it's actually going to take me 60 days to, to build that house. If I, work, if I get the subbies to work on weekends, I might build it a, in a little bit sooner. All right? um, and I'm going to work on the holidays and all that. I know that I can build it quicker than 60 days, so do I reduce my contract? No. Why not? No. You're giving the owner a period of time. If you actually bring the job in, for example, up here somewhere, ahead of time, that is fine. That's sensational in my view, but you're, you've got to give the owner that period of time which you believe will take to build that job, including all delays. Thank you. I just want to go through with what we've done this morning. Have you got any questions? Ah, the question was, you don't know what the incalculable delays are um, when you're signing a contract. Basically, we have a stab at it and we use master builders, so HIA, but they have actually developed a guide. They've taken the last 50 years and put together how long it has actually rained and what effect it has on builders in that month. All right, so if you sign a contract between, if you have a contract between March and July, there is a guide that will tell you how many incalculable delays in that month. Incalculable delays. Incalculable delays would be... I'll give you an example. Patrick's decided to have a strike tomorrow for three months. Yeah. You, can't, you can't determine that. Yeah. No. But that's what I'm saying. If you have a look at the part in the contract where it says incalculable delays, yeah. it actually says state a reason why. It doesn't say there that you have to put days. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. You don't know. All it's saying is what is the effect if you read that, it says, what is the effect that it will have? The effect is it will extend the date of practical completion. That's all your answer is. The ones that you do know, right, you put down as delays. Yeah. The ones that you don't know, I'm not going to go into the clauses and conditions, but you remember the, the 30 clauses? It, it states in there, acts of God, weather, flood, it sort of describes what an incalculable delay could be. If something does happen that you just didn't know about it, at least you, there is a condition that John and I, if we're helping you get through it, could go back to and say, well, this was unknown by the builder at the time of signing the contract. If you refer to clause 26 of the contract, you will see that it is, part, it is something that we can claim as a time extension claim for that. Yep. The question is the cooling off period. Um, if you signed a contract and you haven't given them the contract information statement for 10 days after they signed the contract, the cooling off period starts 10 days. When you give them the both, right? If you've given them a contract back there and you've given them the contract information statement there, that's when they, the cooling off period starts. Five working days. If you sign a contract on a Saturday and you give them the contract and you give them the contract information statement, the cooling off period starts on Monday. 
Okay. There, there is another part to that answer too. The alternative the owner actually has is to actually be able to terminate your contract because you're in breach of the contract. And it's not so much yeah. the contract. What you've got to understand yeah, is point. what is in all the contracts that Paul's explaining here today is in the Domestic Contracts Act. It is not something that someone's written up outside of legislation. The legislation says that you must give the owner a contract information statement at the time of signing the contract. At the time of signing the contract, you also get the deposit, as Paul said, the 5%. So that's at the time of signing the contract. If you fail to give the document, say by a few days, Paul is correct. Your cooling off period will start when you give it to them. So now you've delayed your start for a start. If it's, for example, you give it to them at the end, or even say at the frame stage, the owner can actually terminate the contract. Now you've got a world of pain. Yeah. Don't do that. You're in breach. That's why if you have a look at most contracts, yeah. most of the contracts actually have a idiot sheet part <laughs> which says, have you given the owner a me. contract information statement? Tick yes or no. <laughs> it's, not a it's a no-brainer. <laughs> That's for me, John. There's also a whole world of and a, and something that, that you guys will get on to this afternoon in relation to dealing with companies versus individuals. That's two separate animals as well on their own. So just the private owner. But if you're dealing with a private owner, it gives them the ability to pull out from you, but not so much you to pull out from them. Back in 1999, <laughs> the, government, the state government did a review of the building industry, and it was because so many builders, so many, were actually putting an amount of a PC amount of $500 to clear sites, and there was never enough money. There was so much outrage mm. by consumers, mm. that's where it became is that's that right. you now must give a fair and reasonable mm. price to do the job. So, and that's the wording in the legislation, fair and reasonable. You've got to understand that the legislation was put in place for as owner's protection. The question was, you've signed a contract and all of a sudden you're sitting down doing your orders and all of a sudden you've worked out that you've missed probably a complete floor or complete section in your quote and all of a sudden you don't want to know what to do. Panic. No, the answer to this is quite simple. Guys, the whole idea of the assessment book is for you to set up systems in place. And I think it's fairly evident that when Damien and I sat down to write the book, is that we've tried to give you a mechanism so that this does not happen. Now, I can say for actual fact that it does. I know of an actual case where, for example, a builder, old mate, thought he would actually let his son come up through the ranks and he allowed his son to quote a job. $40,000 worth of windows were missed. The builder went back to the owner and said, look, we've made a mistake, would you help us out? The owner said, you gave me a fixed price contract, that is why I selected you as the builder. The builder had to take a $40,000 hit. Ow. There was no option. So, the answer to the question, when you're doing your takeoffs or you're estimating, have an idiot sheet on the side. Don't be afraid to ask someone to even check it if you have someone in your office. But for example, if you can't, and most of the packages that we have actually recommend to you guys in the assessment, there is no way that you can miss something. If you're doing it manually, it's the only way that you can miss something. 